Okay, so um, by journey with, with ventilation, um, I, in many ways it's been, it's been fairly standard. Um, just the kind of gradual decline in uh, respiratory capacity until I started needing, um, needing a ventilator and um, my ventilation uh, respiratory symptoms were, were monitored. Um, so I, I was initially at the, the Hammersmith when I was younger and then I uh, transitioned um, into adult surfaces and um, I was initially at the, at the Brompton, uh, where I was had my res respiratory symptoms monitored um, every year. And, um, so I started off using an IV overnight. I can't even remember when that was. That was um, at least 10 years ago, um, over probably more than that. Um, and I think uh, it, it did change for me, but I started using it overnight. It, it, you know, it did seem like a a serious um, kind of change in, in my condition that I had to kind of get used to. And, um, you know, I, I was at university and, um, you know, probably being more, more irresponsible than I should have been with, uh, like, drinking alcohol or what have you. But, uh, yeah, when I, when I started using it overnight, I realized I can't actually get completely paralytic. Um, so I do have to kind of be, be careful of, of uh, using the ventilator. So it did... Um, it made me think more about the condition, but I think I, you know, I, I got used to it. I struggled with the, the different masks, finding a mask that actually fit my face. Um, and, I, you know, I, I did have lots of kind of pressure sores around my face, and particularly over the bridge of my nose for, for quite a while, just until I really found the right, the right mask for me. Um, and I think also the uh, kind of the equipment and the masks have come on while I've been using uh, NIV, so they have improved, and I think um, it, it does mean now that I'm not, I don't have any, any issues. It's about getting the right one, really. Um, so I gradually used uh, NIV a bit more, um, and I think and then I got to this kind of transition stage between um, using it just overnight to using it in the daytime, and then kind of using it permanently, and it, it, it was in that little little period when you're using it a bit in the daytime that I was, you know, I, I struggled to guess when I needed the ventilation and, uh, you know, I, it was a bit of trial and error really, like I would try using it in the evenings and actually found that suddenly I had a lot more appetite so it kind of, you know, it made me realise that actually, yeah, I do need to start using it in the daytime. Um, and I think um, because I, I think I got to the point where I could probably manage about three hours of the day without ventilation. And uh, I, I think I just got a little bit fed up of just trying to guess when I needed it and when I didn't. And I just thought, you know what, it's just easier just to start using it regularly. And I just ended up using it pretty much all day. And I think, um, you know, I felt a lot better for it. Um, and, and I think, you know, I'm glad that I did that because then I suddenly wasn't so anxious and worried about the ventilation. and. Um, I guess I'd always previously thought um, with, with Duchenne that I should fight the progression as much as I could and that I should always kind of do as much as I possibly could. But then, you know, with, with the ventilation, it's slightly different because actually if you are compromised with your ventilation, that affects everything else. So you don't really, you don't want to end up in a situation where you're pushing yourself so hard that you're actually struggling to breathe. So I, I, I think... You know, I had to change my mindset a little bit and actually accept um, accept the ventilation and the benefit it, it brought me. Um, I was a kind of a, a guinea pig for trying out the mouthpiece ventilation. So at the moment, I'm using the nose mask. So I, I now have a, I use a combination of the, the mouthpiece and the, and the nose mask, really depending on the situation. I find... Um, the nose mask is much easier for eating. It's also, it's actually easier to speak more fluently when I've got it. So actually when I'm doing some of these presentations, then I find the nose mask actually makes it, makes it easier for me. Um, but yeah, I, I've been, I found that really amazing actually using the mouthpiece because, you know, suddenly I could get the mask off my face when I needed to. And um, yeah, it just makes, it makes a lot of things, a lot of things easier. 
for me, really. Um, but I think, I, I think the, the best thing I've found is that it's a combination of different things. It's not having a single interface, because that will cause irritation if you just have one. Um, and I think now I'm, I'm pretty stable. I haven't had any hospital admissions for quite a long while. Um, I have, you know, antibiotics when I need them, but I haven't had, um, I haven't had a chest infection for, well, probably about six years, I think. Um, so actually, have been very lucky to avoid it. Um, and I also, you know, I try to do whatever I can to prevent it. So I try to avoid people when they've got, when they've got coughs and colds. Um, I, yeah, you, you use various kind of supplements. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really know what the what the overall scientific evidence is for some of the stuff that I use, but you know, it seems to work for me, and that's um, that, that's kind of good enough for me. Um, okay, can I have the next slide? Um, so yeah, I think um, one of the things I, I want to say is just um, again go back to that period when you're transitioning in terms of how much you need to use the ventilator during the day. I think. Um, one thing that I felt is you really need regular monitoring of this, and I think, um, you know, I went to the, I think at that point I was probably going to the respiratory clinic maybe once every six months. It was a slightly more regular, but, you know, even then I get my blood gases taken, but they'd often, that would often be like at 11 o'clock in the morning, and, um, you know, I wouldn't have, or, or I'd have a sleep study, but I wouldn't have that kind of monitoring throughout the day when I, you know, I tended to feel more tired around four or five in the evening. So I would have liked to have a, um, y you know, to measure things then. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, again, what I was saying is, is you know, you're more vulnerable to infection if you're um, compromised respiratory, uh, in respiratory terms. So it is um, important to, to make sure that you are using a ventilator when you need it. I think um, what I also found really useful is having the equipment ready for when I would need it permanently. So, um, you know, thinking about how I was going to work with permanent ventilation in my life before I actually got to that point. So, you know, making sure I had the, um, you know, the, the setup for putting the ventilator on the chair and I had that all figured out, at the, you know, the, the tubes set up as, as I needed them. So. It meant when I actually felt like I needed to have the ventilation, I could do it wherever I was. I didn't have to kind of worry about, oh, now I have to go home because I'm feeling like I need to use the ventilator. So I think it's quite important to, to, to make sure that even before you need it permanently, you're, you're ready for that. Um, again, it's not only a respiratory function issue, it's also about your wider health. Um, yeah, I think since I've been on ventilation permanently, I've had a lot more energy, appetite, less anxiety about whether I should be using the ventilator or not. Um, it's definitely improved my swallowing function, I found, I guess, because I'm not having to focus so much on the breathing um, side of things. Um, it made my speech a lot louder, so um, I was finding, I'd often go to, like, uh, busy bars and uh, events and stuff and no one could hear what I was saying. I mean, it's still, still not great, but I can suddenly speak a lot louder than I, than I was able to without the ventilator. Now, if I took it off now, you, would, you probably would barely be able to hear me even with a microphone. Um, and yes, yeah, you know, I am less vulnerable to infection. Okay, so yeah, I, I mean, some of the challenges you need to think about when you ask, going to be switching to permanent ventilation is, um, you know, how do I manage it with eating? So um, I think it takes a bit of practice, but it's certainly possible. I do, I do it all the time. Um, yeah, you don't have to get used to kind of timing your swallowing and your, your breathing. Um, then also things like, you know, showering when you uh, start to need to use the ventilator in the shower. Um, that, you know, that's just a kind of logistical challenge. Um, so I just, you know, cover the, the ventilator with, with plastic bags and, and keep everything dry. Uh, again, using the mouthpiece is really helpful um, in that kind of situation. Um, things like cleaning teeth. Um, 
So obviously you can't clean your teeth if you've got a mask that goes over your face. Um, so I can do it with this mask um, because that, um, and, and also, you know, I can't do a mouthpiece and clean my teeth at the same time. So you've got, you've got to think about that. Um, yeah, having uh, shaving and having a haircut. Um, if I had this mask on and was trying to have a haircut, it makes it harder. I mean, you, you, I know some people do do it. They move the mask around, but for me, the mouthpiece makes that a lot easier. Uh, again, be, being intimate, that's really important. That you know, you've got this mask on your face, quite hard to actually kiss someone if you're in a relationship. Um, and I think, you know, all of these things can be done if necessary, but uh, like with a mask that goes over the face, but sometimes it can be tricky. Uh, again, you know, the mouthpiece isn't perfect for everything, so it's about getting that, get that combination right, really. Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, the alternative is the mouthpiece. I think um, it, did, it did take a bit of getting used to, and I know some people it hasn't really worked out for. Um, I think, like, so, I think it helps if you've got um, a team that's actually willing to work with you to figure it out. Um, so I guess I benefited in a way being the guinea pig because they were kind of, well, let, this doesn't seem to work, so let's try this instead. And then, so I think we tried different modes for the for the ventilator um, and kind of getting the thresholds right for how often and how much pressure it takes for you to trigger a breath. Uh, you need a proper mounting solution for putting it on the wheelchair. So this this thing I've got at the moment uh, actually works really well because I can use either the mouthpiece or the mask on it. It's just a very quick swap, and it holds it in the right place. If you're trying to hold the the mouthpiece of your teeth on a tube that's pulling on it, that um, you know that's that's not really going to work all day. Um, it's easily removed and put back. Um, obviously, no mask on your face, uh, but yeah. Might not suit all the situations, but I would actually highly recommend people at least try it, see if it works. Okay. So, yeah, the only, um, I, I guess the main challenges for um, non invasive ventilation is, you know, I'm aware that if I do get an infection, then, it, you know, I, it's probably going to be a lot of hard work for me um, to kind of deal with um, using the cough assist and, um, you know, it's, it's certainly possible, but I think you know, suctioning with a uh, tracky is quite is an advantage, certainly. Um, but I think you know, not everybody can get on with the um, the non-invasive ventilation and the mouthpiece. So I think it's really important to have the to have the different options. And, and Tyron can talk more about the the trackies. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, that's where you can find out more. I'll, I'll leave that up there, and uh, there we're while we move over, but um, Tyron's now going to be talking about tracheostomies in, in more detail. <laughs> oh, yes, I did the first one, sorry. Yep, there's a couple of slides on the presentation I was going to go through. I wasn't sure if it was in the middle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so you, um, just to talk to you just a bit about um, tracheostomies and uh, it, it just going through the, the kind of uh, basics of what these are. So um, just to give a bit of context, these slides that I'm going to go through now um, and, and the information we've been, uh, work, we've worked with uh, Professor Anita Simmons, uh, Simons as well on this, so um, yeah, that's why I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm giving the, the right information basically. Okay, so um, a trache is, or a tracheostomy is an opening that's surgically created through the neck um, into the, the trachea, the, the windpipe. So it allows direct access um, to, to, to the breathing tube. And uh, yeah, it's commonly done uh, 
it will operate immediately under general anesthetic. And the tube is usually um, to place through this opening to provide an airway and to remove secretions from the lungs. Um, breathing is done through the tracheostomy tube rather than the, the nose and mouth. So again, like if you're using a mask, it, it, it frees that. You don't need to use a mask at all. It frees that up, frees the face up. Okay, and the, the main reasons that people need to have a trachea are if swallowing is impaired. So if, um, if you're aspirating, so if food and saliva are going down the wrong way into the lungs, then that can cause uh, pneumonia and uh, regular infections. So that might mean that you actually need a, you need a trachea to um, basically to, to, to deal with that and to, to suction all the, uh, the stuff that's going down the wrong way. Um, and then also, potentially, it could be uh, preferred for people if they are 24 hours dependent on ventilation. And uh, yeah, for the various reasons I've explained, if, um, you know, if the NIV doesn't really work for you, if you're um, kind of, you know, concerned about infections and being able to clear them easier, then the, the tracking might be the, the, the best option. So some of the uh, positives and negatives of, of tracheostomy. So um, it's a relatively secure uh, interface um, for the ventilator. Um, you could get the mask off your face, which is a, a big bonus. Um, it's sometimes, in some ways, it's easier to manage the 24-hour ventilation. Um, and I think it provides Obviously, as I said, with the infections, it provides access to the lower airway for suctioning, so it makes it a lot easier to, to suction out. And again, it's necessary if there's aspiration or if there are a lot of upper airway secretions to, to have that suction. And there are uh, speaking valves on the trackies, so that they usually allow both speech and swallowing. So it doesn't mean that you can't speak. Um, it, some of the uh, disadvantages is it can circumvent pulmonary defense mechanisms. So um, yeah, the air uh, that you're breathing in isn't isn't filtered through the the usual way of breathing it through your nose or mouth. So uh, that can be a problem. Um, sometimes it can having a trachea can increase the amount of secretions and sputum. So um, that means there can be a risk of uh, that kind of plugging up and um, there could also be a, a risk of kind of dislodging the trachea as well. I think there's also greater expertise required to change and manage trachea than a LIV mask, so that often has implications for people in terms of the, the carers that they need to employ and the skills that they need to have. I know that with my NIV, that's scary enough for people and I think, yeah, a Tracking could be, could be more so. So it's about getting the right staff. So it's, and in some cases it can impede speech, but not always. And uh, sometimes that can be something that people can kind of learn to learn to deal with. And then finally, it can result in soreness, uh, granuloma, stenosis, and bleeding. And actually, I don't know what stenosis means, um, <laughs> but maybe Tyrone does. Um, so, looking at yeah, some of the reasons why tracky practice varies in different countries. So, um, you know, if you look um, in, in countries, for example, in in Denmark, then um, the kind of the culture there is that everyone has a tracky at an older age. Um, so it's kind of expected and it's routine, and I guess they're they're familiar with how it works. Um, I think. It's often the, the evolution of services and how they developed over time that determines whether or not trackies are used. I think just some of the, some of the concepts to take into account, so things like you need a high level of competency for, for carers in looking after the, for the tra looking after the tracky. Um, there could often be a, like unequal distribution of skills in terms of um, expertise in terms of NIV or tracky, so it's often 
it's often dependent on the the skills and the um, kind of the, the, the teaching of, of some of the experts as to whether or not they would recommend the, the trachea or not. But I think there's also, uh, it's up to the patient really, so patient beliefs may vary in different areas on patient preferences. I mean, if you see kind of everyone with Duchenne having a trachea, then you might be more, more inclined to prefer having a trachea because you know it works and, and you've seen other people do it. I think in terms of the practicalities, again, it's just thinking about the competency level required and uh, making sure that, that carers are, are trained and skilled. Um, some of the issues in the UK is that obviously around funding can be a problem because yeah, once you move to a, a trackie, then you would uh, typically be under NHS continuing healthcare. And if you've kind of changed, you changed your care package, then that can take a lot of time to actually put in place and get people in. So we know people that have ended up in, in hospital because of these, these issues while it gets sorted. So it's important to think about these. Okay, I'm gonna now hand over to Tyron, who's gonna be talking more about his own personal experience. Um, before I had the trachea, I was on non-invasive non intubation with a mask 24 hours a day, which was working well for me. Life was quite hectic, and I just started my second year at university after a two-year absence due to a hospital admission with, with swine flu. Um, my university was really going well, and I'd settled in nicely um, to start making new friends and enjoying the vibe generally. When Professor Nita Simons, in one of my consultations, discussed with me about having a tracheostomy tube fitted. At the time, I was anxious about it because I knew a young lady um, who was at Toronto College with me that had one. She really struggled with hers as she was always on oxygen every half an hour to an hour. She would use a manual resuscitation bag to do some secretions. She could not speak and eat with it. So it's not a good example of a person living with a trachea. I'd also heard that a lot of, a lot of people who have it um, aren't able to talk or eat again. Um, however, uh, Anita did, however, reassure me that it is, that really happens that patients with DMD who have a trachea experiences. I knew that in Denmark the tracheostomies were really well for people living with Duchenne, although I had no practical experience of this. I decided not to have a trachea at this point because I was doing well and it just started my second year at university and knew that by having an operation now would mean that I would have to suspend my studies for a further year. Having a tracheostomy would mean at least a three weeks stay in hospital as well as the rehabilitation to follow learning to talk and eat again adapting my care package for my new care requirements. Um, this turned out to be a mistake. As six months later, 
it got to the point that I was requiring just physio and more and more during the day and was struggling to get rid of all my secretions in the base of my lungs. This meant there was always a slight build up in mu of mucus in my lungs causing me to get regular chest infections. Throughout the year, I became very anxious with getting chest infections as I was struggling to breathe and needed my ventilator pressures to be increased to try and avoid being hospitalized. Uh, unfortunately, disaster, disaster struck and I developed a chest infection which, which led to pneumonia and I became very ill with two hospital admissions in the November. At this time, they failed to pick up that I had an empyema developing in the pleural cavity, which is the space between the chest wall and the lung. Nobody realized what was going on until my body started to become septic and I was extremely ill on life support. Um, but because it was such a difficult incubation, the consultants felt it was necessary for me to have a tracheostomy, which meant I had to spend the next two and a half months in ICU. Um, Empyema is the medical term for pockets of pus that have developed in the pleural space. They can form if a bacterial infection is left untreated or if it fails to fully respond to treatment. This is the space between the outside of the lungs and the inside of the chest cavity. Empyema is a serious condition which requires treatment. It can cause fever, chest pains, breathlessness, and coughing up mucus. Although it can occasionally be life-threatening, it's not a common condition as most bacterial infections are effectively treated with antibiotics before they get to this stage. But with DMD, when non-invasive ventilation is not effective in clearing secretions at the base of the lung, then empyema is more likely to develop. The most common cause of empyema is, is pneumonia caused by bacterial infections of the lungs. An empyema can form when the pneumonia fails to fully respond at, to treatment in a straightforward way. Another possible cause is an infection caused by inhaled food if you have swallowing problems, but this is rare. An empyema is usually suspected when a person with severe pneumonia does not improve with treatment and it starts to show some of these symptoms mentioned. One of the one of the complications I experienced after having my tracheostomy fitted was a pneumothorax, 
which is pockets of air in the pleural cavity causing the lungs to collapse inwards. In this case, the tube was surgically implanted into the chest to drain the air away. Okay. Yep, the closer. In the beginning, it was in the beginning, it was really difficult to adjust as I had a cuff tracheostomy, which meant I could, couldn't talk as the cuff had to be up for the first three weeks while settled in. I developed a technique of click, a clicking sound to call people when I needed assistance. It took me a while to adjust to trying to talk with the cup up, which is like a very faint whisper and is very, and is quite, quite difficult for people to understand. Another thing I had to deal with was the deep suctioning into my airway. And of course, the suction capita was a foreign body that felt very uncomfortable as I wasn't used to this procedure. But over time, it became part of daily life. The next challenge was to start having the cuff down, which I could only tolerate for a few minutes as I was used to the cuff up. And now it felt like I wasn't getting enough ventilation. It was a gradual process of adjusting to the cuff not being down, which I needed to build up over a period of minutes, hours, and days. During this time, I got used to projecting my voice, and my speech became louder as time went on. Also, I had to learn to eat again by trying out different types of soft food, like yogurt, jelly, and puree foods. Gradually, I managed to eat normally again. After being discharged from hospital, there were a lot of changes to my daily routine as we needed to incorporate suctioning as well as cleaning and dressing the tracking site. My experience of adjusting to the tracky may not be the same for someone who undergoes this procedure as a planned surgery as opposed to an emergency situation. Okay. Um, I will now explain my daily breathing procedures to keep my airway as clear as possible. However, this may not be the same, uh, same procedure for those without a tracheostomy. Um, when the day starts, my carers check the settings on my ventilator before changing me over from the humidifier circuit to a dry circuit. I use a coffices machine with compressions to loosen all the secretions deep down in my lungs, followed by a sterile deep suction through my tracheostomy, clearing all my airways. I repeat this process throughout the day whenever I feel there's a boulder of mucus. Here's a video showing this. Oh, it's not, the sound's not working. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. 
I'm going to start my procedure of the proper system section. A section with a sterile procedure. Okay, uh, my tracheostomy tube is fitted with an inner tube which is changed in the morning and in the evening to prevent any buildup of mucus which could cause a blockage. Um, twice a day I use a nebulizer which helps to keep up either which helps to keep my secretions loose and therefore prevents any thick mucus developing during the day. In addition to this, I take a medicine called carbocystin, which helps to keep the mucus loose. At night, when I get into bed, my carers change me from the dry circuit ventilator to my other ventilator, which is attached to an humidifier, which provides a wet circuit, keeping my secretions loose overnight. I repeat the same procedure using the cover cyst and suctioning immediately afterwards. Okay. I have a uh, routine tracky change every six to eight months which is an important step to maintain
to crack off the meat and avoid any infections. This is done in hospital in case there are any complications. Some people um, have their tracky changed more frequently, but there has been little research on how often that should be. Um, this was the best decision that was made, as I've not regretted having the tracky. It has given me a better quality of life, free from chest infections and hospital admissions. In the past, in, in fact, I've only had to have two short courses of antibiotics in the past four and a half years, and I'm no longer anxious about chest infections. This has contributed to a real improvement of cardiac function as my ventilation has greatly improved and there was less stress on my heart. Um, when I was first considering whether to have a trachea, I was given conflicting information as to whether I'll be able to talk or eat again. However, with determination, I was able to overcome these issues. In fact, my speech and eating ability has improved. Um, I, th um, okay. I think that when you're on 24-hour non-invasive ventilation, you should start to think about and plan for tracheostomy because I've learned from my own experience that the complications I endured by not having the trachea at the right time were far worse than the risks associated with a planned tracheostomy surgery. In fact, sometimes doing nothing is more of a risk. I regret not having done this sooner. Um, Mark Chapman and I are living examples where a tracheostomy has worked extremely well. Oh, now, hand you over to Mark. Thanks for listening. I'll just come in a second. Oh, I think I'm on the mic already. That's good. Um, thank you, Tyron. I, I would just add to Tyron's uh, speech that I think we are maybe both ends of the spectrum how um, tracheostomy regulation varies. Because um, luckily I've had very few problems, unlike unlike, tr tri unlike Tyrone, my, my, my issues haven't been as complicated and my experience has been very real. I've been relatively straightforward. Um, I'm just going to go back a bit, a little bit of history and my health really deteriorated with um, respiratory issues around the age of 24. And I started to receive um, basic overnight um, non-invasive ventilation. Um, at that time, in the early 90s, um, the technology wasn't as good as it is wasn't as good as it's become today um, and certainly it wasn't as effective as it is as now and I've seen that huge, uh, a huge 
changing that over the years with other guys. Um, that made a difference to me for a year or so. But then the, the same sort of problems returned. And I'd been told I'd be lucky to reach age of 25. And that I should expect these sort of health problems. Um, I really kept getting chest infections, had um, serious mood swings, was very grumpy, tired, not eating well, and I became a bit of a nightmare to live with, actually. Um, I'd almost given up speaking as it was such an effort to string a sentence together in. Luckily, well, not luckily, but um, around that time, one of my friends uh, with Duchenne recently had an emergency tracheostomy. This saved his life and seemed to help him enormously. Um, uh, so um, I went to visit him. And after seeing how well he looked, um, I was inspired to explore this option. So it was thanks to a very committed doctor at the Edinburgh Western General that I had a tracheostomy in 96, which is 21 years ago. I've aged quite a bit since then. Um, this felt like a very big step beforehand, I was very apprehensive. As I knew there were risks involved in having this procedure. Um, but I had the procedure, um, unlike Tyrone, it was commented um, how I was shouting when I came out of the operation. Um, so I didn't have any problem speaking at all. Um, it was almost a um, it was almost a sudden relief to be able to to have the energy to talk again. I think. Um, however, after the operation, after the operation, my health challenges reduced um, massively. Um, and, and, and because my doctor was a bit um, eccentric, I should say, um, she quickly found a solution to have the ventilator put in another chair that she found and she sent me home only after six days, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, but anyway, and it gave me more energy. It was easier to talk. My appetite improved dramatically. And the most important part was easily suction. Secretion through the tracheostomy, as um, Tyrone explained, it, reduced, um, it reduces the risk of chest infections. Um, it was only afterwards that I found out that respiration, respiration problems cause a whole host of problems like lack of appetite, irritability, and general inertia. It is important to look out for these things as well as loud snoring or episodes of not breathing during the night and make sure you ask for sleep studies. Um, this can identify whether you are getting a harmful buildup of carbon dioxide in your body. Um, surprisingly, my experience of living with a tracheostomy hasn't been too difficult. I cope very well, mainly due to my well 
trained PAs and the involvement of an NHS local community ventilation team. Most of my um, ventilation procedures, including suctioning of secretions, and unlike Tyron, with eight months changes weekly, um, tracheostomy changes. Any problems that we do have, we can phone up the ventilation team and a nurse will visit if required. Um, although because of some uh, NHS cutbacks, unfortunately it's not, no longer 24-7. And at nights and weekends we have the op option of phoning direct to the ICU department who can advise us. Um, as long as you, I, I think, what well, we'd say, as long as you are clear and organized, there's no reason that your PAs or other carers can perform the, the, their, their routinely tasks. Um, and there's no reason that they can't deal, deal well with the responsibility of that. Um, and again, although we discussed some of the problems, um, I would say my common problems are things like inner tube blockages, um, which can easily be changed. That's been, and mucus plugs can be a big problem. Uh, I've had a few vent tubing leaks, uh, which isn't very helpful, but generally. I now have a roll of gaffer teeth in my back. Um, aspiration can be quite an issue. Um, I have to be careful with the types of food I eat. And I need to concentrate when I'm eating. Um, Rarely, rarely I've had any major issues with um, ventilation equipment that are generally um, very reliable. Um, I'd say I do have to watch for low CO2. Um, and I have a, a pulse machine that monitors that for me all night. Um, and of course, forgetting to take essential stuff out with you is a major hassle, so I generally don't forget. But thankfully, we haven't had too many scary situations, and certainly for me, it's worked very well. Um, I don't know the situation in England with the delivery of equipment, but all my ventilation equipment and uh, supplies and everything supplied by the NHS in Scotland. And I've just recently been upgraded to a much newer, smaller ventilator which again is more technically advanced than my last ventilator. So technology is ever changing, thankfully. Um, and I think over the years my views has changed on ventilation options. I used to believe that that tracheostomy was the best and only option for older guys with Duchenne, but thankfully, NIV technology has changed dramatically and it's a lot more effective than it, it used to be. And I think I know a variety of AGs who are either on NIV or 
Dracula, a mask or, or a set thing we see. Jackie Austin me, and I, th I think whatever, I think you should be able to choose what option um, you're most comfortable living with. Or so I wouldn't say there's, there's a route um, you must go down. Um, obviously, um, some of your medical medical problems might dictate which option. Um, but I think there should always be a choice. And unlike Tyrone, I was quite lucky in the fact that it wasn't an emergency. And I made the choice to have a trachea and had time to prepare and organise my life for afterwards. Um, but I, th I think the whole tracky thing can be good for a lot of us. But as I said at the beginning, it, it can vary quite a lot from me not having many problems when I had it to Tyron having a lot of difficulties with it when he had his. But Yeah, but basically that that's my story and my thoughts of ventilation. Okay, so um yeah, just just gonna conclude. Um so I think um for me, like seeing Mark and Tyron on, on track he's had you know, it's it's shown me that it is possible to have a good quality of life and I think um you know, for me, if I did get to the situation where I needed a tracky, I very much would uh, be, be confident in going for that, going for that option. But um, yeah, for now, this this works for me, and I'm I'm quite happy with it. And I think um, I, I I think I've also been relatively healthy, and that shows that you can be pretty healthy with permanent non-invasive as well. So I think it's very much about people having um, that choice and discussing it with their their respiratory consultant as well as to you know how they want to approach the issue when they end up needing permanent ventilation and uh, yeah I, I think um, I, th I think really the the overall message from all of us is that it's possible to have a very good quality of life when you're permanently ventilated and uh, it's just about getting the right the right care and the right support particularly from uh, the, the staff that you help you as well. Okay, thanks very much, everyone, and thank you for uh, the presentations, Tyrone and Mark. Thank you.